So between 22 million and 5.5 million years ago, there was an epoch on Earth called the Miocene, but it is also known among anthropologists as the Golden Age of the Apes. Towards the end of the Miocene, though, some of these diverse apes started doing something a little different, walking on two legs. We debate a lot in anthropology about how we define the beginning of what is a hominin or the beginning of the human lineage versus what is an ape, and the obvious answer for most is culture, but a lot of primatologists would argue, and I would agree, that many ape species do have culture and even some monkeys are able to use items from their environment as tools. So what defines a hominin? Generally, the consensus is a primate that is bipedal or walks on two legs. There are a lot of theories as to why we started walking on two legs, which I'll talk about in other videos, but what is clear is that the ability to walk on two legs allowed us to do many advantageous things that quadrupedal apes cannot. But who was the first ape to walk on two legs? In 2002, in Taurus Manala, a place in Chad located in North Central Africa, paleoanthropologists discovered the squished skull of an unusual ape. Upon reconstructing the skull, the discoverers noticed that the foramen magnum on this specimen, that is the hole through which the spinal cord passes to enter the skull and connect to the brain, was centered on this specimen's skull, um, like it is on humans, bipedal creatures, not positioned at the back as it would be on an animal that walked on four legs. They named this species Cilanthropus chidensis, and it has been dated to between 6 and 7 million years old. This is a bit earlier than the dates we have for the split between the human and chimpanzee lineages. Cilanthropus chidensis is often called a punitive hominin, as we aren't 100% sure whether it was bipedal or not, and in fact some recent evidence from a femur bone suggests it may not be. There's a lot of debate surrounding this species, so it's a good reminder to keep your mind open to new evidence and use lots of different sources to reach a conclusion. Our next punitive hominin and candidate for the earliest uh, human ancestor is Auroran tugenensis, or the Millennium Man. Auroran was discovered in the Tugan Hills of Western Kenya, located in East Africa. He was nicknamed Millennium Man because he was discovered uh, in 2000, although we don't have conclusive evidence that this individual was male. The specimen dates to 6 million years ago, right around the split between human and chimpanzee lineages, making them a great candidate for the last common ancestor. About a dozen fossils were found, um, the most famous of which is a femur bone that, based on the angle of the trochanter, so that's the part that would attach to the hip, suggests that the species could walk bipedally, but its skeleton also appears to be well adapted to climbing in trees. This may support the hypothesis that bipedalism originated as apes walking upright in the branches and using their arms for balance. The species also has low rounded molars and small canine teeth. In 1995, in Aramis, Ethiopia, located in East Africa, paleoanthropologists discovered the first fossil of Ardipithecus ramidus. Today, over a hundred fossil specimens of this species have been found. The specimen dates to between 5.5 to 4.5 million years ago, uh, which is close to the split between the human and chimpanzee lineages. The initial partial skeleton discovered was nicknamed Artie. Artie has a pelvis whose anatomy reflects both the ability to live in the trees and to walk upright on two feet. The pelvis also uh, suggests that Artie was a female. Further evidence for bipedality in this species is Artie's rigid foot, uh, which still retained its divergent big toe for climbing. Ardipithecus ramidus uh, had uh, intermediate enamel thickness, suggesting an omnivorous diet, and the faunal remains found with Artie suggest she lived in a woodland environment, throwing into question the savanna theory for the origin of bipedality. In 2009, an entire issue of the journal Science was in 2001, another species of Ardipithecus was discovered in the Middle Awash region of Ethiopia, Ardipithecus capita. Initially, the new find was classified as more Ardipithecus ramidus, but after studying for three years and making some new discoveries in 2002, the discoverers, along with some other uh, collaborating anthropologists, decided that based on the specimen's uh, more primitive, meaning more ape-like uh, traits compared to Artie, these specimens should belong to their own species. Ardipithecus cavita is considered to have been a direct ancestor of Ardipithecus ramidus, making Ardipithecus um, cavita a chronospecies. Uh, so it is slightly older than Artie at 5.77 to 5.54 million years old. In 1994, in the West Turkana region of northern Kenya, Maeve Leakey discovered a complete lower jawbone, or mandible, which closely resembled that of a chimpanzee, but whose teeth looked more human. 
The find was different enough from Australopithecus afarensis, a Lucy species that I'll talk about in another video, to declare it a new species, Australopithecus anamensis. The name comes from the Turkana word anum, meaning lake. The 21 fossils were found, uh, including upper and lower jaws, cranial fragments, a tibia or lower leg bone, and a humerus or arm bone. But new fossils, including over 90 from the Afar region, are turning up all the time. The species dates to about 4.2 million years ago, just a little younger than Artipithecus ramidus. The evidence, including the geography of the finds and their age range, suggests Australopithecus anamensis was a chrono species of Australopithecus afarensis, so eventually becoming that species. <laughs> It's the summer of 1974, and a research team led by John Johansson and Tim White are working on a dig in Hadar, Ethiopia, located in East Africa, when they turn up an incredible find, a near-complete skeleton of a female human ancestor, which they promptly named Lucy after the Beatles song they'd been listening to all summer. Lucy and her species, Australopithecus afarensis, have some well-deserved fame, so it's going to take me a few parts to cover all the incredible finds, but let's start with a quick overview. Australopithecus afarensis existed on on Earth from about 3.8 to 2.9 million years ago. The volume of their skull is similar to that of a modern chimpanzee, and they are rather short. Lucy stood about a meter tall. The shape of their legs, pelvis, and hips indicates that they walked bipedally when on the ground, but their long arms and particular shoulder structure suggests they were excellent climbers. Check out parts two through five for more. Lucy was an Australopithecus afarensis individual discovered in 1974 in Hadar, Ethiopia. She lived around 3.2 million years ago, but 40% of her skeleton was recovered, providing an incredible picture of what Australopithecus afarensis was like. We can estimate that Lucy was female because of the morphology or appearance of her pelvis, which had a pubic arch greater than 90 degrees. The pelvis is wider, allowing uh, for childbearing, and is similar to modern human females. Lucy stood about 1.1 meter or 3 feet 7 inches and weighed around 29 kilograms or 64 pounds. While she had a small brain case like that of chimpanzees, her pelvis and leg bones functioned like modern humans, meaning she was bipedal. In anthropology, we call this mosaic evolution. Uh, she had derived postcranial features, uh, but her skull or crania was not yet changing compared to other apes. Just four years after the discovery of Lucy's nearly complete skeleton, another incredible find was located in Leitoli, Tanzania in East Africa. A set of fossilized footprints set in volcanic ash, which clearly illustrated two individuals rocking erect on two feet. The trail is about 27 meters or 88 feet long and includes 70 individual footprints. The footprints reveal a human-like foot with a big toe in line with the rest of the foot, and a human-like as opposed to ape-like gait with a heel strike, the heel of the foot hitting first followed by a toe off, the toes push off at the end of the stride. Dating to 3.6 million years ago, anthropologists believe the footprints were left by Australopithecus afarensis, as this species of bipedal ape existed in the region um, where the footprints were found at the same time they were left. We aren't done with Australopithecus afarensis yet. In 2005, another discovery in the Afar region of Ethiopia told us even more about the species. Ketanumu, or big man in the Afar language, is dated to 3.6 million years old, about 400,000 years older than Lucy of the same species. Ketanumu stood about 1.5 meters or 5 feet tall, significantly larger than Lucy, suggesting a high degree of sexual dimorphism or morphological differences between sexes of the same species in this species, more extreme even than modern gorillas. Although I've written about this in the past, it is important to remember that this picture is based on just a few individuals. Modern humans are moderately sexual dimorphic. Uh, males tend to be slightly larger than females. However, if we found, for example, the skeleton um, of my six foot five dad versus the skeleton of my five foot two uh, female university roommate, we would assume high sexual dimorphism that doesn't exist. Last but not least in our Australopithecus afarensis lineup is the Dakika infant. Also known as Salam, an Arabic word meaning peace, the Dakika infant was a three-year-old Australopithecus afarensis discovered in Dakika, Ethiopia in 2006. The find consisted of mostly uh, a nearly complete skull and torso, as well as many parts of the limbs. 
While Salam has been nicknamed a Lucy's baby, the find dates to 3.3 million years ago, approximately 120,000 years younger than Lucy. Similar to Lucy, Salam showed mosaic features that would have allowed both bipedal walking on land and extensive use of tree climbing. Being a child, this find allows anthropologists to fill in gaps in our understanding about the development of fossil hominins. The first specimen of Australopithecus africanus was found in 1924 by Raymond Dart. Dart was sent a box of fossilized bones from a limestone quarry in Tong and was asked to identify them. In this box, Dart recognized one of the bones as early human because the proportions were incorrect for a baboon or chimpanzee. The specimen, a child's skull, was nicknamed the tongue child and was given the specimen the species name Australopithecus africanus, southern ape of Africa. This was the first human ancestor discovered in Africa. Because Dart was not well established in academia, and because despite Darwin's hypothesis that humans originated on that continent, many European scholars doubted this idea, especially in light of the Piltdown forgery, much of Dart's original claims were dismissed. However, an ally, South African paleontologist Robert Broom, searched South Africa for adult specimens of the species, which he eventually found in Sterkfontein Cave in 1936, and many more specimens have now been found both around these locations as well as in Makapanskat, all in South Africa. Follow for part. Australopithecus africanus, depicted here, has a gracile skeletal structure and was likely a generalized omnivore. The specimens date to between 3.3 to 2.1 million years old. The species' inner ear anatomy and their mosaic arm structure, part made between that of a non-human ape and modern humans, suggest they spent a lot of time in the trees, but their leg bones show they were habitually bipedal or walked on two legs. The species displayed some sexual dimorphism, males weighing between uh, 40.8 to 52.8 kilograms, um, where, and, and standing about 138 centimeters, while females weighed between 30.2 to 36.8 kilograms and stood about 125 centimeters tall. In The Descent of Man, Charles Darwin wrote, In each great region of the world, the living mammals are closely related to the extinct species of the same region. It is therefore probable that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct ape species closely allied to the gorilla and chimpanzee. And as these two species are now man's nearest allies, it is somewhat more probable that our early progenitors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. Darwin made what we now know today to be a correct hypothesis, uh, a well-supported theory now. Humankind originated in Africa. However, in 1912, an interesting find was discovered by amateur archaeologist Charles Dawson in Piltdown, East Sussex, located in the United Kingdom. He claimed this find to be Darwin's missing link between the chimpanzee and human lineages. This find included a section of a human-like skull, skull fragments, a jawbone or mandible, a set of teeth, and primitive tools. Check out part two for more info. Part two of Piltdown Man. So the proclaimed age of this specimen was 500,000 years old. While many scientists at the time were immediately skeptical, the Piltdown find shaped our understanding of human evolution, particularly as early Neanderthals, the only hominins known to Europeans at the time, had been found all in Europe. In addition to suggesting the origin of humanity was in the United Kingdom, Piltdown also showed that humans' large brains were the first thing to develop, differentiating us from other apes before changes in our teeth and diet. In 1953, Piltdown was definitively demonstrated to be a hoax. It was a modern human skull, an orangutan jaw, and the fossilized teeth of a chimpanzee which had been filed down and stained with iron and chromic acid to look older. It was likely perpetuated by the discoverer. Note that while this specimen is a hoax designed by someone greedy for fame and ready to perpetuate racist assumptions about human origins, the scientific method found it out, and the other specimens I discuss hold up to rigorous tests of truth. The next species we'll talk about is a bit more contentious as to whether it really constitutes a new species or not. In 1947, Raymond Dart, who discovered Australopithecus africanus, found another hominin specimen which he assigned to a new species, Australopithecus prometheus. After years of consideration, Dart actually reassigned this specimen to Australopithecus africanus since there really wasn't enough differences between the specimen and others to warrant a new species designation. However, in 2014, paleoanthropologist Robert J. Clark recommended reviving Australopithecus prometheus as the species name for the newly found Littlefoot specimen. Um, a nearly complete hominin fossil skeleton found between 1994 and 1998 in a cave system of Sterkfontein, South Africa. Um, check out part two for a bit more on Little. 
The little fit specimen shown here uh, was discovered by a paleoanthropologist, Robert J. Clark, when he was going through um, some museum boxes which had been labeled cercopithecoids and found the foot bones of something that he thought was clearly early human. Um, this led him to go back to the Sturkfontein cave where he found the rest of the skeleton almost entirely embedded in a concrete like rock. Because of this, the recovery of the skeleton um, which has been dated to 3 million years old, took nearly 15 years. While there is an argument between lumpers and splitters about whether this is a new species or not, many, including Clark, assign Littlefoot to the new species Australopithecus prometheus because its unusual features do not match any Australopithecus species previously described. Most of the Australopithecines we've talked about so far were gracile. Um, this includes, for example, Australopithecus anamensis, afarensis, and africanus. They had more lightly built crania and smaller cheek teeth or molars with pronounced facial protrusion. They were likely frugivorous, meaning that while they were generalized omnivores, they mostly ate fruit. Modern humans likely evolved from an earlier species of gracile Australopithecines, but there's a side branch of human evolution that produced some pretty cool cousins. The robust Australopithecines, which are sometimes given their own genus, Paranthropus, were herbivorous hominins with robust cranial features adapted to their diet of heavy vegetation, such as nuts and tough grasses. These features included a sagittal crest running along the top of the skull to anchor large chewing muscles, large cheek teeth, a heavy set lower jaw, wide flaring cheekbones, and large brow ridges. Note that both gracile and robust Australopithecines scenes have fairly similar postcranial skeletons. It's their crania and jaw that it was the year 1990, and paleoanthropologists were in for a surprise. At the Buri site in Middle Awash region of Ethiopia, a new Australopithecine was discovered. The specimen had a gracile cranium, but teeth as large as any robust Australopithecine. Tim White named this species Australopithecus gari, gari being the word for surprise in the local AFAR language. And it was a surprise because they weren't expecting such a mosaic of traits. The find, which consisted of a single cranium and four other skull fragments, has been dated to 2.5 million years ago. Australopithecus Kisgari was discovered with the oldest known stone tools as well as some animal bones that appear to have been broken open with those tools, making it possibly the first hominin to transition to stone tools and the use of meat and bone marrow for food. The original discoverers of this species suggest it represents an ancestor of the genus Homo, but this claim remains contentious as more evidence is needed to draw a full picture, this being the only specimen we have right now. In the late 1960s in the Omo River Valley region of Ethiopia, a strange set of hominin dental remains were discovered. Later in 1985 in the West Turkana region of northern Kenya, skull WT17000 or the Black Skull was discovered by Alan Walker and Richard Leakey. These were the remains of a robust Australopithecine. Younger species of robust Australopiths had been found by this time, which I'll talk about in future videos, so the genus Paranthropus already existed, but this was a new species, Paranthropus ethiopticus. This species dates to 2.5 million years ago and shares many characteristics with other robust Australopithecines such as a strongly protruding face, large or megadont cheek teeth, a powerful jaw, well-developed sagittal crest across the top of its skull indicating huge chewing muscles. Um, and interestingly, the species has a cranial capacity of only 410 cc's, the smallest of any hominin. It is considered by most anthropologists to have been the ancestors of the other robust Australopithecines um, and some questions whether it should even Paranthropus ethiopticus was older, but Paranthropus robustus was discovered first. In 1938, in Cromdry, South Africa, a young boy discovered a partial skull that made its way to paleoanthropologist Robert Broom. If he sounds familiar, it's because he's now spent most of his career digging up Australopithecus africanus. But this skull was different. He named it Paranthropus robustus, the genus name uh, meaning beside man, as it likely formed a lineage branching off from our own, and the species name to reflect the skull's well robust traits. By 1948, several additional skeletons had been found at Swartkrans, also in South Africa. Paranthropus robustus dates to between 2 to 1.2 million years old and had very large molars, premolars, a robust mandible, heavy built face, and distinctive sagittal crest across the top of its cranium. As a specialized omnivore, these traits were needed to uh, crush high and grind hard foods like nuts, seeds, roots, and tubers. A specimen discovered last year shows they had a cranial capacity of about 450 cc's and their height is estimated at 4 foot 4 inches. Um 
2008, in the Malapa Valley of South Africa, Matthew Berger, the son of paleoanthropologist Lee Berger, discovered the right clavicle of another ancient hominin. Dating to around 2 million years old, this new species shows us what Australopithecines looked like around the time the genus Homo began to emerge. This new species was called Australopithecus sebida, sebida meaning a fountain or wellspring in the local language. The find at Malapa Valley consisted of a partial juvenile skeleton and a partial adult female skeleton. The juvenile was nicknamed Carabo, meaning answer in Tswana. The interesting thing about Australopithecus sebida is the species displays a mosaic of primitive um, Australopithecine traits and derived homo-like traits. Australopithecus sebida two of Australopithecus sebida. So as I was saying, this species is a mosaic of primitive and more derived traits. So Australopithecus sebida had long arm limbs and a small cranial capacity of 420 to 440 cc's, like other Australopithecines, but had small premolars and molars, um, as well as similar facial features to genus Homo. They also displayed derived pelvic features um, for improved bipedal walking, suggesting changes in pelvic anatomy and dentition uh, occurred before changes in limb proportions and before cranial capacity increased. Australopithecus sebida is thought to be a chronospecies descended from Australopithecus africanus. Berger and his colleagues proposed that Australopithecus sebida was ancestral to the genus Homo or uh, a closely related ancestral species. However, this conclusion is contested given that there are fossils from genus Homo which would have lived at the same time as Australopithecus sebida. And uh, it's actually Australopithecus sebida is a cast on my necklace. In the 1950s, the Leakeys were discovering some pretty interesting hominin prehistory in Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania in East Africa. The first fossils of the hominin species, Paranthropus boise, were discovered in 1955, but it wasn't until four years later when Mary Leakey found a cranium that they realized they had a new species on their hands. The species named Boise honors Charles Boyce, who funded the Leakeys expedition. Since then, additional species of Paranthropus boise have been recovered in the East Rudolph region of northern Kenya and Konzo, Ethiopia. The species is described as being hyper robust, so even more robust than the other two Paranthropus species I've talked about so far. And I'm going to make a part two with the specs of the species.